so on Tuesday we talked to, we were talking about polymers, this whole course is about polymers, about big molecules. We said a little bit about natural polymers. We talked about the different physical states in which we might encounter polymers. We talked about glasses and rubbers and semi-crystalline polymers. And we focused then on glassy polymers and rubbery polymers. Glassy polymers like polystyrene, which uh, it is uh, usually transparent unless it's filled with something and brittle, and rubbery elastic polymers. We talked about what is it that makes something elastic. And we saw that uh, the elasticity of a piece of rubber has its origins in the elasticity of a single long chain molecule which arises because there's an entropic driving force. If you stretch a molecule out, you have few conformations available, low entropy, so there's a, a driving force to increase entropy by making that chain coil up. And what we saw was that if we did an experiment like a uh, X-ray scattering, X-ray diffraction, we couldn't tell the difference between a glass and a rubber because they both look like liquids at the molecular level. But in a glassy material, that liquid-like structure is frozen in place. It's a liquid that can't move over the time scale of the experiment that we're performing. And you'll remember that the transition between a glassy material and a rubbery material depends not only on temperature, but also on time scale, because it's dominated by kinetics. So that's what we did in the last lecture. Now we're going to move on to think about that other group of polymers that we mentioned, semi-crystalline polymers. So today and tomorrow, we're going to be talking largely about polymers which are able to crystallize. And a good example, one that we all meet every day, is polyethylene, uh, a simple, long hydrocarbon chain uh, and that uh, is one of the more highly crystalline polymers that you will encounter. Although, as we mentioned in the very first lecture, you actually will come across different grades, different sorts of polyethylene in industry, in everyday life, polyethylene that you will use, some of which are more crystalline than others. So-called high-density polyethylene, which is mostly a linear polymer, mostly long chains without much branching, uh, crystallizes much more than low density polyethylene which has lots of long chain branches. So it's semi-crystalline polymers we're going to talk about today. And in that context we're going to also pick up on something that you should know about from organic chemistry which is stereochemistry and see a little bit about how that might apply to polymers and how that will affect whether or not a polymer will crystallize and if it does, how it crystallizes. So we're talking now about polymers which uh, can have some kind of long range order. Crystallinity means that we have long range, three dimensional, translational order. Uh, and so we need some sort of regularity in a molecular structure that enables it to pack in some way if it is going to be crystalline. So if we have a polymer, perhaps like polyethylene, we can imagine if we stretch it out, it's quite a regular structure. If we started, start putting groups on the side, uh, that can break up the structure unless they're well organized, which is why stereochemistry is important, as we'll see a bit later. But something like polyethylene, we can imagine uh, stretching it out and lining it up and packing it in some way. It can crystallize. And where we have crystallinity, if something can crystallize, it can also melt. And so there will be a melting point associated with the crystalline regions of a polymer. And uh, this is something different to the glass transition we talked about last time. The glass transition, remember, is not a first order thermodynamic transition. It's a bit like a second order thermodynamic transition, but even not quite that because of the influence of kinetics. But a crystalline melting point is a true first order thermodynamic transition. Although, as we'll see, it's not quite as simple as when we're dealing with a small molecule crystal because polymer uh, crystalline melting points are not as well defined. They can be different depending on the history of the sample. But this is a true thermodynamic change, 
And therefore, when a crystal of a polymer or a crystalline region of a polymer melts, there is a change in things like volume and enthalpy and the other things that change discont discontinuously. There's a sudden change in them uh, that you can read about in Atkins or any other physical chemistry textbook. So we can ask the question, if we plot, for example, the volume or the specific volume, specific volume is volume per unit mass, of a semi-crystalline polymer, as the temperature varies, what will we see? And you may, may remember we asked this same question last week about an amorphous polymer which undergoes a glass to rubber transition. And if we give that an amorphous polymer, remember the word amorphous means that there is no long range order. That is not crystal. So a glass is amorphous, a rubber is amorphous, and if you have an amorphous polymer, what we saw was that when you reach the glass transition, there isn't a sudden change in a property like volume or specific volume, but there is a change in the slope of the line of how volume changes with temperature. There's a change in the thermal expansivity. And so we just have a change in slope at uh, that transition temperature that we call the glass transition. We also said that actually depends on time scale, depends, for example, if you start in the rubbery phase, if you cool quickly, you will get a different glass transition to if you cool slowly. But what happens if our polymer can crystallize? Well, I've said that these are semi-crystalline polymers. We very rarely get a pure crystal, although later in this lecture we will talk about when we can get pure crystals of polymer. But usually when we encounter a polymer, it's semi-crystalline. We have little bits of crystalline regions, but also amorphous regions. And we'll talk tomorrow about how the crystalline regions and the amorphous regions are organized or arranged in a sample of a polymer. Uh, so even a semi-crystalline polymer, the amorphous regions will show a glass transition. And so there were, we will see a change in slope associated with the TG because some of our material is amorphous. Okay, and so below that temperature, we'll have a mixture of glassy and crystalline regions. Above that temperature, we'll have a mixture of crystalline and rubbery regions. But at some higher temperature, it has to be a higher temperature. Remember, the glass transition is where we no longer have any motion. Below the glass transition, unless you give something a really long time, nothing moves around. We can't crystallize, we can't melt. So crystallinity has to be associated, it has to, crystals have to form and melt at higher temperatures than the glass transition. And so at some higher temperature, there will be a point where we get that step change in volume, or if we're plotting something else like enthalpy, a step change in enthalpy. That's what you expect for a real thermodynamic first order change of state. It may not be quite as sharp as that, because actually we may have a range of crystalline melting points within one sample. But we see that step change. And then, once it's melted, it will behave just like an amorphous sample of the same polymer. We'll think a bit, perhaps tomorrow, about how you can get a sample which can crystallize, but depending on how you treat it, you may get it into the glassy state, either as a pure glass or as a semi-crystalline polymer. And then the results will be this different when you repeat it up. So for a semi-crystalline polymer, we expect to see a bit of a something happening in the glass transition because there are always amorphous regions, but then we see a distinct jump when we reach the crystalline melting point, just as we do with any other crystalline substance. Hi there, do you need a handout? There you go. Okay, so uh, a melting point will always be higher than glass transition, and actually, um, it's usually a similar proportion higher. For a lot of polymers, you find if you take the glass transition and divide by the melting point, you get a number somewhere around a half to 0.65 if the temperatures are in Kelvin. In other words, if you push up the glass transition, you tend to push up the melting point proportionately. So the ratio of the two tends to be for most polymers within a small range of values. And this, of course, is 
because the, the things which affect TG, the sorts of molecular factors we talked about last week, the things which make a TG high, um, also can, tend to make the melting point high. Okay, so if we have a very flexible polymer, the TG will be low, but the melting point will also be low. If we have a very rigid backbone, the TG will be high, but the melting point will also be high. And as I've already indicated, for a polymer, you don't have one single well-defined melting point. Because, as we'll see when we think a bit more about the morph tomorrow about the morphology of semi-crystalline polymers, you can actually get um, crystals with different uh, effective sizes, uh, which actually have different melting points. So the history of the sample, the thermal history, what's actually happened to that sample, will determine whether we have crystallinity, how much crystallinity, and exactly what the melting point is, although it will be in a certain range. Now, if, something, if we're going to have crystals that are going to melt, they have to form under some conditions. They have to form under conditions where there's much no, enough mobility for molecules to get together and organize themselves. So, crystallization, the formation of crystals, has to form at a temperature above Tg. And of course, it's going to melt at Tm, so the rate of crystallization is going to be at a maximum somewhere between, uh, often roughly midway between, Tg and Tm. So you're too close to Tg, we haven't got much motion, so things can't organize themselves very fast. If you're too close to Tm, they're actually trying to melt, but they're virtually on the verge of trying to melt. So somewhere between Tg and Tm is when crystallization occurs most rapidly. And we'll see, uh, tomorrow we'll say a little bit about differential scanning fluidity, which is a technique which can be used to see these transitions. One of a number of techniques which can be used. So we've got a semi-crystalline polymer. So this is, this is polyethylene here, something like this. It, the reason it's wh wh white is because there are lots of little tiny crystalline regions which scatter light a lot. But it's flexible, it's not glassy. It's above its glass transition, but it's relatively stiff because it's highly crystalline. Okay, so, so what questions might we ask? Well, first of all, if we have a, a, a crystal, one of the basic questions as chemists we always ask is what is the crystal structure? How are the molecules actually organized in those crystal, crystalline regions? And we know what sort of technique we use to study that, X-ray diffraction or X-ray scattering. I'll say there's just a little bit about that. But then there are other questions we have to ask because, as we said, we don't usually get there is an exception I'll mention later. We don't usually get pure polymer crystals. Usually what we have is a lump of polymer with lots of little crystalline regions. And so we've got to ask, how are those little ordered regions organized? And how are the disordered, the amorphous regions organized? And if you take even a nice simple polymer like polyethylene, actually you end up with quite a complex structure. Morphology here is about the shape and arrangement of the crystalline regions. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then there's another question uh, which one has to ask, because I've said that we'll have crystalline regions and amorphous regions, so we can ask how crystalline is a sample? What is the degree of crystallinity? An important question, I'm not going to say much about it on this course, but you should be aware that the question exists. But I will mention tomorrow differential scanning colorimetry, which is one of the techniques which can, uh, if you're lucky, uh, give you information about that. So we're going to focus for a bit on the crystal structure, not go into a lot of detail, just make you aware of how things you should already know about small molecule X-ray diffraction might apply or be different when one's dealing with a polymer. So if we think about wide-angle X-ray scattering, and I said this last Tuesday, if we take a typical semi-crystalline polymer sample and put it in an X-ray machine, uh, what you will see is a pattern of rings. And that's the same sort of thing you see if you take a powder made up of lots of little tiny crystals. So that immediately tells us you've got lots of little crystalline regions pointing in different directions. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're totally randomly distributed. 
we'll see tomorrow there's actually quite a complex structure. But broadly speaking, if we take a, a, a piece of uh, semi-crystalline polymer, a bit of polyethylene like this, what you will see is something like powder diffraction. But suppose you take, let's say, a fiber and pull it, stretch it out. As you stretch a polymer, or even as you stretch something like this, if you can pull on it hard enough, then those crystalline regions will tend to order themselves. Not entirely, but you know, if they're all pointing in different directions, when you stretch it, they'll tend to follow the line in which you're stretching. And so you'll start to see more structure. Not lots of well-defined spots, not very well-defined spots as with a small molecule or large single crystal, but actually something on the way to spots, what we call layer lines. And if we pull the fibre to see these lines, the, the rings break up into layer lines, then uh, what we see, spots that we see in the um, equatorial direction, are telling us about the peak distances perpendicular to the fibre axis, and spots that we see in the meridional direction are telling us about distance along the fibre axis. So we can start to get information about how these molecules are organized. So this is an example of what you might see for a highly, well, this is actually uh, isotactic polypropylene. We'll talk at the moment what we mean by isotactic, but these are fibers which were processed in a way that stretches them. And so instead of having rings, we can start to see that we've got uh, not very well defined spots, but clear uh, sort of splurged out spots in the equatorial and meridian, meridional directions. So that's the sort of thing you might see for a drawn fiber or something which has been stretched out. This is actually <coughs> this isn't very exciting, but actually there's some information in there. This was actually done quite a long time ago by a student, by a student here, but it was done at the synchrotron source that used to be uh, at Dullesbury. Uh, and this is using very intense beam of x-rays to study a very, a tiny, tiny single fiber. In fact, it's a polyacrylic nitrile. This was part of a series of studies to understand how carbon fibers are formed. But polyacrylic nitrile is interesting because it's almost amorphous, but actually there is some structure there, particularly when it's stretched. We start to see some structure. Uh, so again, you can start to see, instead of rings all around, we're actually getting certain distances uh, in, the, in this case, the equatorial direction. And that's giving us information about the internal structure. So we can use X-ray diffraction in similar ways as we do with small molecules. We don't get as much information, but there is information there about the organization of molecules. And once we've got uh, X-rays, and hopefully most of you know a little bit about this, we can uh, index the reflection, reflections we see to define a lattice. A lattice is just oh, an array of points in space. The intensity of those reflections are related to the way the molecules are actually organized. Now, getting that information, actually solving a structure is quite tricky because of something known as a phase problem, but there are ways of doing it, and it's commonly done. Um, I won't go into details here, but it can be done. So we'll come back to that sort of thing a bit later. But what I want to do now is to talk a little bit about stereochemistry and how that will affect the way molecules crystallize and the structures that we see. And this, so the beginning bit is, you know, um, you know if we take something like this polyethylene molecule, this is quite complex. You know, how is this going to organize? But let's start, instead of taking polyethylene molecule, let's just take a little bit of it. A, a small molecule, like uh, butane or something, and ask what do we know about that? And then see if we can extend what we know about that to more complex molecules. Now, when we go ahead, as, as, as we think about this, we also need to make sure that we understand the difference between uh, two words which you should have, we all met the words configuration and confirmation. Yes? No? Yes? Somebody's nodding. You should have done. So, if you've got a, some atoms joined together to form a molecule, if you, if you can change the shape just by rotating about a bond, without actually breaking any bonds, then you're changing the conformation. 
If you want to change the shape and you have to actually break a bond and reassemble the atoms in a different way, we have different configurations. It's important to be aware when we're talking about conformation and configuration. So if we have a big polymer molecule and it coils up, and we talked about how the way coiling up uh, is responsible for rubber elasticity, uh, we're just rotating about back from bonds. We're not breaking any bonds or forming bonds. We're changing its conformation, its shape. But we can have molecules with the same chemical structure but different configurations. And the configuration will determine what conformations are likely. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, the two guys who... Um, you know, a lot of polymers, we only actually meet as glasses. You know, I said polystyrene is glass. That's how we normally meet it. But actually, you can get polystyrene, which is not glassy, which crystallizes. And the difference is that the polystyrene we normally meet is not stereoregular, but if you use particular catalysts in particular ways, you can make stereoregular polystyrene. And... Uh, now, there was somebody, some famous person, who I've forgotten who it was, the head of some company way back in the, I think the 1950s, early 1960s, who said, um, you know, polymer chemistry is finished, we've discovered all the polymers that we need. Now, there'll never be another important polymer. And then Ziegler and Natter came along and demonstrated how you could make stereoregular polymers, and that opened up a whole new branch of chemistry, a whole new range of properties. And so a lot of the polymers we use now are stereoregular polymers, derived from Ziegler and Natter's work. In fact, I think they were working, they got the Nobel Prize in 63, I think it was quite a long time before that that they did their work. Now when I think about polymers and polymer stereochemistry, there's a word you need to understand, the word is tacticity. Tacticity is telling us about the uh, configurations that we have in our polymer molecule. And I'm going to give you a very simple introduction here, um, but actually it gets more complex. Now we should all know, hopefully, what an asymmetric carbon atom is. Is that right? What's an asymmetric carbon atom? <laughs> Come on. Certainly over, uh, all the undergraduates here have done organic cellular chemistry, yeah? So what's an asymmetric carbon atom? <laughs> you all know the answer. Don't be shy. Someone. <laughs> it is a chiral group. What makes it chiral? What, what, or this example of a chiral group? Okay, if you have a, if you have a tetrahedral carbon atom with four different groups attached to it, it'll be chiral, yeah? We're all happy with that idea. So you've got two different stereoisomers, yeah? You've all met that before. Is it news to anyone? No, it's not, right. Now, we have an interesting thing. Suppose we have a long polymer molecule, and we stick a, a bit on the side, somewhere. Now this is a carbon atom here, it's got the bit on the side, it's got a hydrogen or whatever, and it's got two chains of different lengths. So it's sort of asymmetric. Except the next one, if it's a regular pattern, you've got two chains of slightly, slightly different lengths. Okay? So, it, so it won't be chiral in the sense that we think, it's a pseudo-asymmetric. But it's still important, you can make chiral polymers, but it gets a bit more complicated. How that it, it's sort of semi-asymmetric, um, but um, it, doesn't give chiral, it doesn't give optical rotation chirality in the same sense, because all, two of the groups, although they're different, they're only a little bit different, and it's a little bit different difference for each group along the chain. Uh, so we can think about it as being like an asymmetric uh, carbon atom, um, but it's not quite... Uh, like we're talking about in organic stereochemistry. So we have a typical polymer, an asymmetric vinyl polymer is something like polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, polyvinyl alcohol, that's, that's a slight exception. 
for odd reasons. But all of these are polymers which uh, are derived from a monomer where we've got a double bond, two hydrogens, usually a hydrogen, something, sometimes something else on the other carbon, and some other group, an aromatic ring if it's a if it's polystyrene or something like that. So when we've got that group on the side, we can now think about different possible configurations. We'll think of three extremes. If we imagine stretching out our polymer, if we find all the R groups are on the same side of the chain, we're going to call that isotactic. If we find the R groups alternate, so one's on one side, the next one's on the next side, the next one's on the first side, alternating, we're going to call that symbiotactic. And if it's just a random, disorganized arrangement, no regularity, we're going to call that atactic. Now, of course, being bright people, you will immediately realize that those are just extremes, that we can get all sorts of things between those extremes, where we have a certain degree of isotacticity or whatever. We're not going to worry about that for now, but you might want to bear that in mind for the future. It can become important when one's making polymers. We'll just distinguish between three extremes, those where the side groups, when you stretch the chain out all on the same side, that's isotactic. Those where the side groups alternate when you stretch the chain out, that's syndiotactic. And those where there is no regularity in the stereochemistry of those uh, carbon atoms along the backbone. And we'll call that atactic. Okay, so we're going to come back and ask how the tacticity will affect the way a polymer crystallizes, or doesn't. But first, let's go back to a nice simple molecule. We'll start with the simplest molecule, instead of a long chain, we'll start with butane. This is something you should all have met before, since it's just with vision. Here's butane. And you imagine that all the things sticking out are carbons. And you should have met the idea before that if you look along the middle bond and rotate about that bond, then the energy of that molecule, the potential energy associated with that molecule, depends on the angle of rotation. Is that right? You've all met this idea before. And so some rotational isomers are energetically more favorable than others. It may not be a big energy difference, but there is an energy difference. And so there are confirmations where if you look along the middle bond, everything's lined up. So everything's as close as it might be to each other. Those are eclipse confirmations and those are unfavorable energetically, yeah? That, that's not news to anyone, is it? Yeah? We've all met that idea. And you should also know that if you just rotate a little bit, you can get confirmations where everything is as far apart as possible. If we look along that middle bond, those are staggered confirmations. They will be the lowest energy. They'll be the most favorable. So eclipsed is high energy, unfavorable. Staggered is low energy, favorable. And so we can draw a rotational energy diagram. And we've probably done so. I'm sure most of you will have seen something like this before where we go from the most unfavorable, which is actually the, the eclipse confirmation where the two big bulkiest groups are in line with each other. So that's a high energy, the highest energy state. For the other extreme, we have the trans confirmation where the two bulkiest groups are as far apart as they can possibly get. That's the most stable confirmation. But then there are two other low energy points, the gauche ones, where the confirmation is staggered, but the bulky groups aren't quite as far apart as in the trans. So we've got one, two gauche confirmations. So that means there are three energy minima, three energy maxima, and a, a, an energy barrier from getting from the gauche to trans about, uh, in butane, about 13 kilojoules per mole. An energy difference between those two minimum states of about three, nearly three and a half kilojoules per mole and an energy difference between the cis and the trans states of nearly 17 kilojoules per mole. Now those aren't big energies. At room temperature, there's enough energy to get over those barriers, so rotation occurs. But those are real minima, and if you study a molecule like uh, butane by uh, infrared spectroscopy, you can identify the three low energy isomers. In other words, we can think of this molecule 
as for having those three low energy isomers in equilibrium. They will jump between one and the other because they can get over those energy barriers, but by and large they will sit in one of those minima. Okay, so that's all, that's all familiar to everyone, isn't it? Nice and easy. Hopefully, everyone's met that idea before. Okay, now let's make it just a tiny bit more. We won't make it a polymer yet. Let's add just one more carbon atom. Let's have pentane. Now, there are two middle bonds about which rotation can occur. Four low energy confirmation. But we can follow this argument too. We can say, right, if, if we take that, what would be the lowest energy of them all? If we imagine that we're going to sit in one of the minima, trans or gauche, then we can have the first, if the first is trans, the second could be trans or gauche. If the first is gauche, the other can be the same gauche or the different gauche. Yeah? So we've got a number of options. But which will be the, any ideas which will be the lowest energy of all that lot? The first one. Yeah? If trans is low energy, put another trans, still low energy. Okay? And then it comes TG, GG, GG minus. And the difference in energy between trans and gauche is a little bit different to what we had for Q10, 2.1 kilojoules per mole. You don't need to worry about that. We're not going to work through the implications of that on this course. If you actually follow this, if you went and did a master's course and follow this through to see how this all influence change statistics, you would realize that little energy difference actually is quite important for certain things. But we won't worry about that for now. So what we've said is, okay, start with a little molecule, we know something about what happens as you change the conformation, as you rotate about a bond. And we can predict what will be the lowest energy conformation. And so now it's a simple thing to say, right, instead of just a little molecule, let's just extend that argument to a really long molecule. We've got lots and lots of CH2s, so we've got polyethylene. And so we immediately can work out for ourselves what will be the most stable conformation of polyethylene, the lowest energy conformation. Well, the lowest energy conformation would be when everything is a zigzag, when it's stretched right out so everything is trans, what we call a failure zigzag. Of course, we've already said that polyethylene uh, will actually want to coil up from that position. Because entropy means there are more coil forms. But when something crystallizes, it will crystallize usually in its lowest energy conformation. So in the crystalline regions, we expect all trans pain a zigzag for polyethylene. Okay, so polymers usually crystallize in their lowest energy conformations. And so just thinking, just taking what we already know from organic stereochemistry, just extending the argument a bit further, we can expect that when polyethylene crystallizes, when we look at the structure at the level of the unit cell, tomorrow we'll talk about a higher length scale, when we look at more, more of the pattern. When we look at the, the level of what we can see by X-ray diffraction, we would expect to see the chains in a plane and zigzag form, and indeed, when you do a structure analysis, that is exactly what you find. And in fact, they pack into a pattern with a coordination of number of six in an orthorhombic unit cell. So that, that's the, the crystal structure for polyethylene. That isn't the end of the story for polyethylene, because we also have to think about morphology. We'll pick that up tomorrow. But now let's ask, what happens if we look at a different polymer? Let's take polystyrene. Polystyrene, which of course, actually, we normally meet it as a glass. But what happens if we have stereoregular polystyrene? Now, in polystyrene, we're now putting an aromatic ring on every other carbon atom. So a little bit of polystyrene along the chain, we've got a big bulk aromatic ring on every other carbon atom. And what happens is going to depend, then, on how those big aromatic bulky groups are organized. So let's think about isotactic polystyrene. Remember, isotactic polystyrene is what you would have if you, if you imagine stretching the polymer chain out so the backbone is a plane of zigzag, then those aromatic groups 
will all be on the same side of the chain. So if we think about the possibilities that we have, just focusing on two neighbouring bonds, then extrapolating that to what happens for a long molecule, remember polyethylene, we said trans-trans will be the most favourable conformation. But supposing we do this with isotactic polystyrene, if we try to make it trans-trans, you've got these two big aromatic rings getting in the way of each other. So that is no longer the most favourable conformation. Uh, and if you uh, work it out, and the best thing to do sometimes with this is to get some electro models and play with them for yourself, to convince yourself of these. Some people are very good at visualising things three-dimensionally. They look at this and they'll immediately see what I'm talking about. Some of you struggle with three-dimensional visualisation. You need to go away, build a, modicle, build a model, convince yourself of it. But if you think about the different possibilities, here we've got overlap between uh, these aromatic rings. If we go gauche gauche, the aromatic rings are on red hot, but we've now got two dangly chains get, getting in the way of each other. Uh, gauche gauche minus, again, we, we, we actually get quite a lot of uh, interference. So the best thing here is trans gauche, where the chains are pointing each other, away from each other, and by taking, we to, by taking this off there, and putting it on there, got to break the bond, this is changing the configuration. Now they're pointing away from each other when the flat bone uh, uh, is in a uh, trans trans state. So, actually, I'll come back to that in a moment. If it's isotactic, the best way to get those uh, side groups uh, away from each other is just to twist the backbone a bit so we go trans -gosh. And so the lowest energy will be where we go trans gauche, trans gauche, trans gauche, all the way down the chain. Now, if you think about that, we're now turning the backbone a little bit. 120 degrees each time. Turn, turn, turn. If you keep turning, what do you have? You have a helix. So just by thinking about the structure, without doing any experiments, we would predict that isotactic polystyrene would crystallize in a helical form. Not a pen zigzag, a helix. Which in fact it does. It's what we call a 3 1 helix uh, because there are three repeat units where we turn the helix. So isotactic polystyrene can crystallize, and the crystal structure it actually has a helical conformation. And if you look down the helix, then you've got side groups pointing out in three directions. That's the lowest energy conformation. That's the conformation it will adopt when it crystallizes. Now, as I've already hinted, if we move on to symbiotactic polystyrene, we're now moving, we're breaking a bond, moving an aromatic ring over. Now, if we try to do tra trans gauche, we got, get, start getting more interference. But if we go back to trans trans, now, the aromatic rings are pointing away from each other along the chain. So now trans-trans is favourable again. So for syndiotactic polystyrene, we go back to crystallisation in a plain zigzag form. So immediately we can see that stereochemistry is important. It influences the way something will crystallise. It influences the more favourable conformations. Now, if we have ataxic polystyrene, we have no regularity. And so it can't crystallize at all. We meet it as a glass. So there are different sorts of polystyrene. We most commonly actually meet ataxic polystyrene. So it's not crystalline, we only meet it as a glass. But you can make it isotactic, you can make it syndiotactic, in which case it will be semi-crystalline, but the crystal structure will depend on the tacticity. So, will ataxic polystyrene crystallize? No. At room temperature, it's a glassy polymer. So we're starting to see how you can play with the structure and end up with quite different, for the same 
polymer, the same chemical composition, you can end up with things which behave quite differently. One bit of polystyrene will be glassy, another bit will be crystalline, another bit will be crystalline, but have a different crystal structure because of a difference in the stereochemistry. Okay, you know, I said that we don't normally need polymers as single crystals. Actually, we can get polymer single crystals. When we meet big lumps of polymer, you know, we never get really big crystals, but you can get little tiny crystals. You can grow them. I did this actually when I was doing my PhD for polypeptide. If you have a very dilute solution under the right conditions, you can actually grow tiny crystals of a polymer. But they're really, really tiny. Okay. Um, this actually is an image of polyethylene single crystal. Polyethylene tends to crystallize in this sort of diamond like shape. This is an image from atomic force microscopy. And this is a really big polyethylene crystal. If you look at the scale here, it's nearly three micrometers long. That's enormous for one of these. Quite hard to get one that big. <laughs> so we're talking about things you can't, too small to see in an optical microscope, but we can see them uh, by an atomic force microscope or an electron microscope. And another thing you'll notice, this is the, the, the crystal here. Okay, so it's a sort of a diamond shape. It's very thin. <coughs> And that, again, is typical of polymers. They, when you form these single crystal of polymers, they tend to be what we call lamellar crystals. Quite flat, but very thin. Okay, so the polypeptide that I mentioned, I should have brought some pictures, um, that I was working with in my PhD, it formed nice little hexagons. Flat hexagons. Different polymers, different shapes, which relate to the crystal structures that we talked about. In the case of polyethylene, it's a sort of a diamond-like shape, but a very thin flat lamella crystal. Now, there's something really interesting about these the flat crystals that you can get. This is um, a diffraction pattern from poly a polyethylene single crystal. This is a single crystal we're getting spots. This is actually not X-ray diffraction, but electron diffraction. So this is an done in an electron microscope in the diffraction mode. Okay? But we can see here, we're now getting, because this is a single crystal, we're getting uh, the sort of spot-like pattern that you will you, you expect for single crystals. It's not what we saw before for bulk samples, where if you really pull on it, you can start to sort of separate out into diffuse arcs, but they're not well-defined spots. Here we've got some really well-defined spots, uh, just like you would see for any other single crystal. And of course, if we do a fair bit of maths and calculations, we can work out the uh, structure that we have there, which actually I showed you earlier, how polyethylene molecules are arranged in the unit cell. But here's a really interesting thing. This is looking down on the top of one of these very fat crystals. So what we have is a nice, it's a flat crystal. And looking down on the top, we can see this pattern. Which means that the polymer molecules are going that way through the crystal. But I said these crystals were very thin. They're actually a lot thinner than the length of the molecule. So what's happening? This is going through the crystal, but it's reaching an edge. So it must fold back on itself. So these crystals are chain folded. They're not stretched out chains. Locally, they're stretched out. But in the crystal, they actually go across the crystal, fold around, and go back into the crystal, come out the other side, fold around, go back into the crystal. That way, you can actually accommodate the fact that you have a mixture of molecules of different sizes. So when we look at these very tiny, thin polymer single crystals, which are typically only 10 nanometers or so thick, the polyethylene chains, we don't like polyethylene, and it's the same for nearly all other polymers that one studies. There are some exceptions, but this is the norm. 
then the chains go across the crystal, fold over, go back to it, fold over, go back to it. To it. They're chain folded single crystals. And tomorrow, when we talk about morphology, we'll see that we get the, some of the same effect in a bulk sample of a polymer. That it's actually favourable when you balance out the surface energies and the energies associated with crystallisation to, to have a chain folded sur surface rather than trying to stretch out all of the individual chains into a chain extended crystal. So tomorrow we're going to continue to talk about chain crystalline volume, talk about their morphology. We're going to say a bit about differential scan scanning colorimetry, which is a way of getting information about melting points, glass transitions, and such like. And we're also going to say a little bit about some other polymers, what happens when polymers can't change their conservation. <laughs>